Rosalie would sometimes show her lover's epistles to me, to convince me what a kind, devoted husband he would make. She showed me the letters of another individual, too, the unfortunate Mr. Green, who had not the courage, or, as she expressed it, the spunk, to plead his cause in person, but whom one denial would not satisfy. He must write again and again. He would not have done so, if he could have seen the grimaces his fair idol made over his moving appeals to her feelings, and heard her scornful laughter, and the opprobrious epithets she heaped upon him for his perseverance. "'Why don't you tell him, at once, that you're engaged?' I asked. "'Oh, I don't want him to know that,' replied she. "'If he knew it, his sisters and everybody would know it, and then there would be an end of my... ahem. And besides, if I told him that, he would think my engagement was the only obstacle and that I would have him if I were free, which I could not bear that any man should think, and he, of all others, at least. Besides, I don't care for his letters, she added, contemptuously. He may write as often as he pleases, and look as great a calf as he likes when I meet him. It only amuses me. Meantime, young Meltham was pretty frequent in his visits to the house, or transits past it, and judging by Matilda's execrations and reproaches, her sister paid more attention to him than civility required. In other words, she carried on as animated a flirtation as the presence of her parents would admit. She made some attempts to bring Mr. Hatfield once more to her feet, but finding them unsuccessful, she repaid his haughty indifference with still loftier scorn, and spoke of him with as much disdain and detestation as she had formerly done of his curate. But, amid all this, she never for a moment lost sight of Mr. Weston, she embraced every opportunity of meeting him, tried every art to fascinate him, and pursued him with as much perseverance as if she really loved him and no other, and the happiness of our life depended upon eliciting a return of affection. Such conduct was completely beyond my comprehension. Had I seen it depicted in a novel, I should have thought it unnatural. Had I heard it described by others, I should have deemed it a mistake or an exaggeration. But when I saw it with my own eyes, and suffered from it too, I could only conclude that excess of vanity, like drunkenness, hardens the heart, enslaves the faculties, and perverts the feelings, and that dogs are not the only creatures which, when gorged to the throat, will yet gloat over what they cannot devour, and grudge the smallest morsel to a starving brother. She now became extremely beneficent to the poor cottagers. Her acquaintance among them was more widely extended her visits to their humble dwellings were more frequent and excursive than they had ever been before. Hereby, she earned among them the reputation of a condescending and very charitable young lady, and their encomiums were sure to be repeated to Mr. Weston, whom also she had thus a daily chance of meeting in one or other of their abodes, or in her transits to and fro. And often, likewise, she could gather, through their gossip, to what places he was likely to go at such and such a time, whether to baptize a child, or to visit the aged, the sick, the sad, or the dying, and most skillfully she laid her plans accordingly. In these excursions she would sometimes go with her sister, whom, by some means, she had persuaded or bribed to enter into her schemes, sometimes alone, never, now, with me, so that I was debarred the pleasure of seeing Mr. Weston, or hearing his voice even in conversation with another, which would certainly have been a very great pleasure, however hurtful or however fraught with pain. I could not even see him at church, for Miss Murray, under some trivial pretext, chose to take possession of that corner in the family pew, which had been mine ever since I came, and, unless I had the presumption to station myself between Mr. and Mrs. Murray, I must sit with my back to the pulpit, which I accordingly did. Now, also, I never walked home with my pupils. They said their mamma thought it did not look well to see three people out of the family walking, and only two going in the carriage. And, as they greatly preferred walking in fine weather, I should be honoured by going with the seniors. And besides, said they, you can't walk as fast as we do. You know you are always lagging behind. I knew these were false excuses, but I made no objections, and never contradicted such assertions, well knowing the motives which dictated them and in the afternoons, during those six memorable weeks, I never went to church at all. If I had a cold, or any slight indisposition, they took advantage of that to make me stay at home, and often they would tell me they were not going again that day themselves, 
and then pretend to change their minds, and set off without telling me, so managing their departure that I never discovered the change of purpose till too late. Upon their return home, on one of these occasions, they entertained me with an animated account of a conversation they had had with Mr. Weston as they came along. "'And he asked if you were ill, Miss Gray,' said Matilda. "'But we told him you were quite well, only you didn't want to come to church. So he'll think you're turned wicked.' All chance meetings on weekdays were likewise carefully prevented, for, lest I should go to see poor Nancy Brown or any other person, Miss Murray took good care to provide sufficient employment for all my leisure hours. There was always some drawing to finish, some music to copy, or some work to do, sufficient to incapacitate me from indulging in anything beyond a short walk about the grounds, however she or her sister might be occupied. One morning, having sought and waylaid Mr. Weston, they returned in high glee to give me an account of their interview. And he asked after you again, said Matilda, in spite of her sister's silent but imperative intimation that she should hold her tongue. He wondered why you were never with us, and thought you must have delicate health, as you came out so seldom. He didn't, Matilda, what nonsense you were talking. Oh, Rosalie, what a lie! He did, you know, and you said, Don't, Rosalie, hang it! I won't be pinched so! And, Miss Gray, Rosalie told him you were quite well, and you were always so buried in your books that you had no pleasure in anything else. What an idea he must have of me, I thought. And, I asked, does old Nancy ever inquire about me? Yes, and we tell her you are so fond of reading and drawing that you can do nothing else. That is not the case, though. If you had told her I was so busy I could not come to see her, it would have been nearer the truth. 